Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Los Alamos Historical Society's lecture. I feel obliged to inform you that we will not have a lecture this evening. We instead will have a performance. Yay! Uh, my name is Todd Urbach, and I'm a board member with the Historical Society and the program chair. Now, there's a certain demographic made up of people who were not alive in the 40s, but are alive now and in their 40s. And they may not know the difference between Ernie Pyle and Gomer Pyle. <laughs> Who is Gomer Pyle? Jim <laughs> Neighbors, that's right. Who is Denver Pyle? An actor. Is it? That's Bob Denver. Yeah, Gilligan. Maybe you're not so sharp on history. That's true. He was Uncle Jesse. <coughs> and appeared on the Andy Griffith show as well. What is a pile driver? That's a wrestling move. You all know that. Who is Ernie Pyle? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so don't answer that. I hope he doesn't you're not, say you're gonna what do are pile <laughs> You're going to meet Ernie Pyle. It's coming. Tonight's performer is the consulting historian at the Los Lunas Museum of Heritage and Arts. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Art History at the University of New Mexico and did graduate work yeah. in the history of photography and design right. practices. He holds a Master of Arts degree in Education. He's the author of three books um, that are being sold in the back this evening. Uh, Images of America, Los Lunas, and Images of America, Socorro, published by Arcadia Publishing. His book, Images of America, Belen, uh, has won a 2014 New Mexico, Arizona Book Award for History. His current book project is The Historic Branches of Northeastern New Mexico, to be published by Arcadia Publishing. Tonight's performer taught computer science, mass communications, and film history at the University of New Mexico, computer programming, and advanced database design at the College of Santa Fe, and taught at the Solar Voltaic. Couldn't get along Solar anywhere. Voltaic Academy at Central New Mexico Community College. In 1998, he was named Teacher of the Year at UNM Valencia. He's a member of many historical societies, including this one. He currently serves as the president of the Valencia County Historical Society and is the secretary of the Historical Society of New Mexico. He is a member of the Philmont Scout Ranch Staff Association and attended Philmont Scout Ranch on expeditions in 1960 and 1961 and was a member of the seasonal staff in 1962. His wife, Laura, is a Los Alamos native, and they live in Tomei, just south of Albuquerque. Everyone, let's, let's hear it for B.G. Burr. <laughs> the setting for this performance is the South Pacific Island of Yashima, part of the Okinawa chain of islands. It is mid-morning on Wednesday, April 18th, 1945. Correspondent Ernie Pyle is in a tent, awaiting the arrival of a jeep that will take him and the commanding officer of the unit he is covering to the front to observe troop movements. Toward the end of the performance, there will be a chance for the audience to join Dame Vera Lynn in singing the iconic World War II song, We'll Meet Again. You'll have to share copies at about 25 on each side. So share with Let's give another round of applause for our performer, B.G. Bird. Light. Thanks, Todd.
You know, the best thing about this island is that it's hot. And I just hate the cold. I grew up in Indiana on a farm. The winter's so cold the snot would freeze in your nose. And I hated it. And I didn't much like living on the farm either. But at least I'm warm here. I've got to get this column out. And it... Oh. <laughs> you know, every GI carries a wallet full of photographs. And I'm no exception. And I got these photographs here. Look at that. I haven't looked at these for a while. There's one right there. That's, uh, oh, that's me. Uh, Dana, Indiana. A little farm to, uh, outside, outside of Dana, Indiana. That's pretty small. <clears throat> and uh, I didn't, didn't, didn't like farm work. Um, what I did, this, this photograph, I must have been 10 years old when that was taken. And uh, it's in the summer, obviously. The thing I liked about summer uh, is I could travel. Uh, we used to go to, uh, uh, to Terre Haute, uh, Indiana, to the circus. And I certainly enjoyed that. And the trip that I probably enjoyed more than any other, and I did several times, uh, was to the Indianapolis 500 in Indianapolis. Uh, and, but gr growing up on the farm, main occupation was just to not be on the farm and to be somewhere else. And uh, eventually I went to, went to school, I went to school in, uh, in Dana, and I didn't enjoy that either because I was a farm kid. And the town kids made fun of us and, and said, said we wore funny clothes and, and funny hats, and, and, and I didn't like that. And I don't know, now that I think back on it at this point in my life, you know, growing up in the Midwest, it's it kind of an automatic inferiority complex. You're, you're not the East Coast and you're not the West Coast and, and you're just kind of that place in the middle and there isn't anything real distinguished about Dana, Indiana. Uh, uh, those, those states that start with vowels. Um, so anyway, that, uh, uh, that was me about 10, about 10 years old. I was born in 1900. Um, guys, guys carry pictures of their cars. That was my first car. That's a 1916, 1916 Ford Model T. And it was brand new, which was really something for a 16-year-old kid in Dana, Indiana to have a brand new Model T Ford. And you could get it, I remember, you could get it in uh, uh, any color you wanted, as long as it was black. Um, but I, I, from the very beginning, I just, I loved cars. And, and, and couldn't get enough of them. And to me, from the farm in, in Dana, the, the car was freedom. I could, I could go wherever and whenever. And, and just from the earliest time, I, I'm, I'm 16 when I got this car. Uh, I just, I knew that that was, that was freedom. And uh, went to Indianapolis. Uh, this is, uh, oh, I, I know why I kept this. This is Joe Dawson. Uh, and this is the 1912 Indianapolis 500. And I was there. And, and, and I'm, I remember Joe winning. And it was just such an amazing thing to me. He, he, was, he was such a hero. All the drivers were heroes to me. I wanted to be a race driver. Never, never did, but sure wanted to. 19... 1912, wow. Well, I, I, I went to high school in Dana, and I graduated. And of course, graduation from high school means you get to get out of Dana. And, and I did, and, and I actually went uh, to Indiana University. Now, I have no idea why I kept my yearbook picture from, Dana, Indiana, uh, from Indiana University. I know why I liked Indiana University. I liked it because it wasn't Dana. 
and I liked it because it was small. Uh, Bloomington was, was not that small a town, but it was still pretty small. The thing I liked about Bloomington was all the cars. I had never seen so many cars in my life as I saw in, in Bloomington. And every one of them uh, was, was just a, a treat to, to see. Uh, when, I, when I got to Indiana University, I didn't have any idea what I wanted to study. I just knew I didn't want to be in Dana, Indiana. Uh, and I wasn't. And I didn't have any idea what to study. And one of the first people I met at Indiana University was a guy named Paige Cavanaugh. And, and uh, Paige, uh, Paige was from Salem, Indiana, another little town, and so we, we had a lot in common. One of the main differences between me and Paige, though, uh, I was too young for World War I. I just got into the Naval Reserve right at the end of the First World War. Well, Paige had been in for two years. And you talk about someone that was heroic in my eyes, that was, that was Paige Cavanaugh. And so I, I met him when I, I first got to Indiana University, and I told him that I didn't have any idea what to study, and he said, well, uh, why don't you study journalism? And I said, well, why would I do that? And he said, well, because it's easy. <laughs> and, and so that seemed like a good idea to me, and unfortunately, my freshman year, uh, journalism classes weren't available for, for freshmen, but uh, eventually I did uh, manage to uh, to sign up for, for journalism classes, and uh, I became a journalism major. Uh, at one point, I was the uh, editor of the Indiana Student Daily, um, and 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 wrote articles for the for the paper. Um, we used to we used to ha hang out at a place in Bloomington uh, called the Book Nook, uh, and I'm not sure why they called it the Book Nook because I don't remember ever seeing a book in the book nook. What I remember about the book nook was another Indiana University student uh, had a really weird first name. His name was Hoagland. Hoagland Carmichael. And, and he, would, he would come to the book nook and they had a piano there and he would sit down at that piano and I'll never forget if there was any sheet music on the piano, Hoagland would sit down and take the sheet music and turn it upside down and then play whatever he was going to play by ear. Couldn't read a lick of music. Uh, and I, I always wondered uh, if, he, if he continued uh, playing music or if it was just something that he did. Uh, I don't know how you get by in, in showbiz with a name like Hoagland, uh, but that's, uh, that's what he did. Uh, the other thing that I, I remember about my days at Indiana was a lot of drinking. Uh, and we didn't do a whole lot of drinking in, on the farm in Dana, Indiana, and so that was kind of a revelation to me uh, uh, to be able to do that. Uh, one of the things that happened while I was at, at Indiana, uh, the baseball team at Indiana University um, got invited to Japan to go play baseball. And I heard about this, and as far as I was concerned, that, this is the greatest travel opportunity I've ever had. This is a lot better than the circus in Terre Haute. And, and so I managed to get myself uh, assigned to the trip as one of the managers on the baseball team. Uh, and I also told some folks, well, I could cover it for the Indiana Daily Student. And, and so they let me uh, go on the trip to Japan. And I remember we... Uh, uh, well, there, there, there's the baseball team right there. I, I, I kept this. Uh, and uh, we went to Seattle, and we boarded the ship uh, Keystone State, and I, I didn't have the fare, and so I had to work my way. So I signed on as a bellboy on the, uh, 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 the Keystone State uh, ship, and that was fine, the work wasn't too hard, and uh, I, I managed to uh, work my way across from Seattle to Japan, and the baseball team and the ship got to Japan, and uh, they wouldn't let me leave the ship, because I was on the crew, and the crew couldn't leave the ship. And so the baseball team went off and, and, and played baseball games, and uh, I had to stay on the ship. Uh, but it wasn't without its benefits, uh, because since I had to stay on the ship, uh, I got to go to Yokohama, and Tokyo, and Kobe, 
And later I got to go to China and the Philippines on the, uh, the Keystone State, which I thought was not a bad, a bad trade for not being able to follow the, the baseball team around and, and wash out their underwear. And I thought, well, you know, this is a, this is a better deal. Uh, by the time I got back to Indiana uh, and Indiana University, I was a big man on campus. I was a BMOC uh, and I had a girlfriend. I, uh, I'll never forget her. Her name was Harriet Davidson and uh, a pretty redhead. God, I remember her. And um, she jilted me. And, and I did it my, my senior year about six weeks before we were supposed to graduate and she threw me over for some other guy. And I did the only thing that made any sense at all. Uh, I quit school. <laughs> and, uh, and, and got a job, got a job right away uh, with the LaPorte, Indiana Herald. <clears throat> and uh, a, a, another small town in Indiana. Uh, but the advantage of working for the LaPorte Herald was it's this little small town newspaper. And if you work for a small town newspaper, you do everything. You, you sell ads, you write the ads, you go down to the courthouse and you check out what's going on and you write about that. And you write about accidents and you write about who goes to visit who. And, and, and if you want to learn the newspaper business, working for a paper like the LaPorte Indiana Herald is definitely the way to do that. Um, and a, a kind of, uh, in keeping with a pattern of mine, uh, I worked for the LaPorte Herald uh, for three months. And then I got an offer uh, with the Scripps Howard newspaper chain uh, to go to work in Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C. is the heart of great journalism in America. It wasn't New York City, not then. It was, it was Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C. was where things were happening. Uh, and, and so here I am in Washington, D.C., uh, in the heart of the finest journalism going on in America, and I go to work for the uh, Washington Daily News, uh, which was a, uh, a, a one-cent tabloid. Um, and I kept saying, well, it's a job, <laughs> and I'm, I'm a journalist. And, uh, and, but that was some crew uh, that worked at the, at the LaPorte Herald. That, that fellow on the left in this, in this picture here, uh, <laughs> that's me, <laughs> fresh, fresh out of Indiana University and the, the uh, uh, late of the LaPorte, Indiana Herald, uh, one Ernest Taylor Pyle. Uh, that's me. And that, that fella in the middle there with the big smile, uh, that's Lee Miller, uh, also from Indiana. Um, he's, he's from uh, 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 Bristol, Indiana, and it was great to see another Indiana fella uh, there in Washington, D.C., and he and I became great friends. And in fact, uh, in later years, uh, Lee was my boss and, uh, and, and really took good care of me as my boss. And so we kind of had a lifelong uh, uh, relationship uh, after a meeting at the, uh, at the Washington Daily News. I started out as a reporter, which was great. I loved that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, and a short time after I started being a reporter, uh, the guys at the Washington Daily News also discovered uh, that I had a knack for uh, editing copy coming in on the wires. And I had really good, good skills at uh, writing uh, headlines. And so all of a sudden I'm not a reporter anymore, I'm a copy editor, and I'm stuck on a desk all day, and I'm trying to write great, uh, great headlines. And, and probably the only thing that really kept me sane during that time, I developed uh, what my, my friend Lee Miller termed a uh, uh, formidable ability to hoist a jar. Um, we, we would, uh, <laughs> when we put the paper to bed, uh, we'd get some of the, the desks and push them together and, and start a big poker game. And I'd go get a half a gallon or so of, uh, of uh, bootleg liquor and we'd cut that with whatever happened to be at hand, uh, fruit juice if we were lucky, motor oil if we weren't, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and make a pretty good drink. 
Uh, and they had to be pretty good because, Lord, we drank a lot of them. Um, so uh, Washington, D.C., uh, working for the Washington Daily News, uh, was a lively crowd of people. Uh, but the, probably the best thing about being in Washington, oh, looky here, being in Washington, D.C., is I met this girl. Now, this is not Harriet Davidson. Uh, this, in fact, is uh, Geraldine Elizabeth Siebolds. Uh, I was born in 1900, and Jerry was born in 1900, too. Uh, also, uh, we were born in, the, born in the same year. And um, I think the best way to describe her is anti-conventional. Uh, if there was something that she was expected to do, uh, she wouldn't do it. If there was something she was expected to do a certain way, she'd do it another way. Uh, and that's actually what I liked about her right off the bat. Uh, we met in 1924. Jerry came to, to Washington when she was 18. Uh, and, it, and it wasn't easy. You'd think it was, was something for me to leave the farm. It was not easy at all for Jerry to leave a small town in Minnesota at 18 years old and come to Washington, D.C., uh, which she did. Uh, we met in 1924, uh, and we were married in 1925. Uh, one day in, uh, in, in 1925, uh, we just decided to get married, and we got in the car and drove to Alexandria, Virginia, and got a justice of the peace, and, and he married us. And Jerry's only condition for me marrying her was uh, it was okay for us to get married, but we couldn't tell our friends. Uh, she, she somehow thought it was better for people to think we were living together than that we were conventionally married. And uh, that was okay with me. Uh, I actually did it for the folks back in Dana. I knew that, uh, that, that they would think that was the proper thing and, and that that was what I ought to do, and, and, and so I did. Uh, so we were married in 1925, and uh, in 1926, uh, we both decided to quit our jobs. Uh, Jerry quit her job at the uh, uh, Civil Service Commission, and I quit my job with the Washington Daily News, and we'd saved up about $1,000, and we spent about half of it on this car right here, uh, this 1926 Ford, and uh, we had some money left over, and we were going to drive around the rim of the U.S. Uh, together in this car, <laughs> and we did. Uh, we camped out. Uh, we were gone for 10 weeks, and we drove a total of 9,000 miles, and uh, it was a great trip. We really enjoyed it, and we came back refreshed. Uh, of all the places that we went on that 10-week, 9,000-mile trip, uh, the place we loved the best was the Southwest. There was just, just something about that. Uh, it was instant, and it was, it was the same uh, for both of us. Uh, when we came back, uh, I kind of bounced around for a little while in New York City, uh, did some newspaper jobs, but eventually, uh, they asked me to come back to the Washington Daily News. And we had friends there, and so it just, just seemed like a, a good idea. Uh, and so we went back to the, uh, to the Washington Daily News. Unfortunately, uh, I was still on the desk and uh, still editing copy and writing headlines and, and kind of pretty much stuck on a desk. And that was even harder to take after our trip around the rim of the United States uh, than it had been before. Uh, but I did it, and after a little while, in uh, uh, 1928, I convinced the editors at the Washington Daily News to let me write an, a, a column on aviation, which was a big thing then. Uh, and you know, it's not, it's not a real stretch uh, to go from admiring uh, uh, race car drivers uh, to admiring pilots and the people who flew airplanes in 1928. And uh, basically, they're the same kind of folks. Only now, uh, I got to meet these folks, and I got to talk to them and, and hang out with them. And uh, I even uh, got a pilot's license. 
and there's, there's my uh, uh, pilot's license. Um, uh, I took flying lessons. I got to meet a lot of pilots. I met Amelia Earhart, and I met Eddie Rickenbacker, and I wrote columns about them. And uh, I, I did the uh, aviation column uh, for uh, four years, from 1928 to uh, uh, 1932, uh, and that was, that was great. Um, 1932, the Washington Daily News needed a managing editor. And you talk about out of the frying pan into the fire. Uh, I didn't like editing copy in the first place, but to be the managing editor of a newspaper was even worse. Um, and the, the worst part about that was I had to stop writing my, uh, my aviation column. And I, I kept my last column. Um, let's see. Uh, here it is. Here it is. This is the last column I wrote uh, for, uh, for my aviation column. Uh, it was in 1932. This column has tried to feel with those who fly. It has recorded the surprised elation of those who have risen rocket life into renown, has felt despair with those who have been beaten down by the game, has shared the awful desolation of those who have seen their close ones fly away and come back only in the stark blackness of newspaper headlines. This column has made enemies, too. But they were enemies who wouldn't have been very good friends anyhow. The good friends, and they can be counted by the thousands, are what signify. This is the end of what to me has been an epic. So that was the last, uh, the last aviation column I wrote. Uh, and, and so 1932, I'm the um, um, uh, managing editor of the Washington Daily News, and I'm stuck on the desk, and uh, there isn't a thing I can do about it. They were, they were good columns, though. And, and of course, the, the, the people that we, I met as a result of the column, the, the flyers and the, and the people involved in aviation, uh, our apartment kind of became the social ground zero. Uh, probably had something to do with the fact that you could always get a drink at our place. Um, and uh, if you didn't mind gin cut with shoe polish, uh, that was probably uh, not, a bad, not a bad deal. Um, but in uh, 1935, I had had it with a desk job. And I told the people at the Washington Daily News that, and I told them that uh, uh, they either had to find something else for me to do uh, or find a, 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 a new editor, because I wasn't going to do that anymore. And fortunately, uh, they allowed me, I, I made a proposal to them, and to my absolute surprise, uh, they accepted it. And the proposal was that I become a roving reporter. And I just travel around the country and write about whatever I think is interesting and go wherever I want to go and see whoever I want to see. And they said yes. They said, OK. And you talk about being in heaven. And Jerry, uh, <laughs> I called her in the column, uh, that girl who rides with me. And she did. Uh, every place the left-hand seat of that car went, the right-hand seat went. And sure enough, she was in the right-hand seat. There she was. And she was well-suited to it. She, she really genuinely seemed to enjoy it. Uh, she was very much her own person, and so as we would drive around, uh, she, would, she would read, uh, she checked the map for me, uh, and then when I was uh, uh, writing my columns, uh, she would read them, she would type them, I would write them out, and then Jerry, as a result of her work at the civil service, uh, would type the articles for me, and she would edit things, and she would tell me when she thought something was well written, and she would also tell me when she thought that I had done better. Uh, and I really appreciated that. Um, at the time, uh, I, I was syndicated. Uh, that was one of the deals for, to, to allow me to write this column. Uh, they had to uh, uh, syndicate it. I was syndicated in 25 or 30 newspapers uh, around the country. They were all Scripps Howard newspapers. Um, but that open road was, was just heaven. Um, and no responsibility. 
Uh, we could go wherever we wanted, stay as long as we wanted, leave whenever we wanted. Uh, it was kind of, a, of, a, of an irresponsible life in many ways. Uh, if we were in a situation that we didn't like or that was uncomfortable or that required something from us, uh, we just move on. We wouldn't have to stay there. Uh, if we were around unpleasant people, we didn't have to figure out how to get along with them. We'd just get in the car and go to the next town. Um, and I would go into these towns and I would either look up the editor of the newspaper uh, or the uh, chief of police. And they would tell us about the oddballs, the characters, the, 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 the interesting people. Uh, I kind of have this reputation of writing about the common man. And nothing could be further from the truth. I wrote about uncommon people because they were easy. I mean, you run across some person that's just weird as an outhouse rat. Uh, that's not hard to write about them. You just describe what you see and what they did, and you got a great column. And you don't have to make anything up. And uh, all you have to do is just is find these oddballs, and, uh, and, and you're, you're good to go. Um, so for five years, Jerry and I just traveled around the country, uh, living out of hotels and, and camping, uh, basically just camping out. And uh, uh, like I said, we, we did that for, uh, for five years. Uh, but we began to feel that uh, at the very least, uh, we need some place to keep our stuff. Because uh, we had more stuff that wouldn't fit in the car. And, uh, and so we contracted with some folks. Uh, our earlier trips, we discovered the Southwest. And we loved Santa Fe except for some of the people in Santa Fe. Uh, and, uh, and we loved Albuquerque. And one of my great friends uh, became, uh, he and his family became great friends of both Jerry and me, uh, was Ed Schaefer in Albuquerque. He was the editor of the Albuquerque Tribune, which was a Scripps Howard newspaper. And, uh, and we became great friends. And so Jerry and I thought, well, we'll move to Santa Fe and we'll build a house there and, uh, and that'll, that'll be our house. Uh, except it was too expensive. We, we couldn't afford Santa Fe. Uh, and so we came down to um, uh, Albuquerque and we built a house in Albuquerque. Uh, Earl Mount and Arthur McCollum uh, built this house for us, uh, kind of to our specifications, but also a, a lot of what they wanted to do. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we built this house and boy, did we get a lot of static from, from people. Why'd you build a house like that? Look around. There aren't any houses like this in Albuquerque. They're all beige and, and rounded corners and made out of mud and, and not like this house. And, uh, and, and they asked us, uh, why Albuquerque? Of all the places to live. Well, I wrote a column about it. Um, and it actually it starts out, why Albuquerque? Uh, well, that's a hard question to answer. There are many little reasons, of course, but probably the main thing is simply a deep, unreasoning affection for the Southwest. I guess it's like being in love with a woman. You don't love a woman because she wears number three shoes, or eats left-handed, or has a diamond set in her front tooth. You just love her because you love her, and you can't help yourself. That's the way we are about the Southwest. And here are the things we like about living in Albuquerque. We like it because we have a country mailbox instead of a slot in the door. We like it because our front yard stretches as far as you can see. And because Old Mount Taylor, 65 miles away, is like a framed picture in our front window. We like it because you can cash a check almost anywhere in Albuquerque without being grilled as if you were a criminal. And because after your second trip to a filling station, the gas pumper calls you by name. We like it because people are friendly and interested in you, and yet they leave you alone. To a vain fellow like me, it's pleasant to be stopped on the streets downtown by perfect strangers and told they enjoy your columns. And yet these thoughtful strangers do not ask anything of you and do not leave you standing in fretfulness. So that's why we liked Albuquerque, and we built this house. And, and uh, <laughs> it still leaves the question of, of why we built a house like that. And, uh, if uh, <laughs> I've got this other snapshot here. Oh, look at that. That's the house I grew up in. 
in Dana, Indiana. And darned if it doesn't look a lot like that, uh, that house in Albuquerque. Uh, you know, growing up in a small Midwestern town, only a person who has not grown up within the intimate confines of a Midwestern farm community can ever understand the terror that grips parents that somehow their children will embarrass them. And that's the way I grew up. Well, so we started the house in 1940. And uh, part of the reason for the house, uh, and I said it was just to have a place to store our stuff, but actually Jerry needed something to do because she wasn't doing too well. That uh, uh, uniqueness of hers uh, had a tendency to turn into depression. And, and we both drank a lot. Uh, but she was drinking when I wasn't drinking. And she was drinking when other people didn't even know she was drinking. And then she got some drugs and amphetamines and benzedrine and that's a bad combination. And somehow I thought if Jerry's got this house to worry about and, and construction details and decorating and all of this, um, that that would help. And it didn't really help a whole lot. And she continued to spiral down uh, in and out of sanitariums and the depression got worse and I didn't know what to do. So I left. It was kind of a reaction to a lot of things in my life. When it got unpleasant, I left. Fortunately, in this case, I had a place to go. Um, things were happening in Europe, and uh, the Blitz was on, and the world was coming to a war, and uh, you know, when the rest of the world is at war, it's kind of hard to justify writing columns about hermits in Utah. Uh, it was harder and harder to do. So I got the Washington Daily News to, uh, to send me to London. And I, I got there just at the heart of the Blitz. And it was certainly an exciting time to be there. Um, I wrote about it. I don't know if I'm proud of this or not. Uh, Dateline London, England, 1940. Someday when peace is returned to this odd world, I want to come to London again and stand on a certain balcony on a moonlit night and look down upon the peaceful silver curve of the Thames with its dark bridges. And standing there, I want to tell somebody who has never seen it how London looked on a certain night in the holiday season of the year 1940. For on that night, this old, old city even though I must bite my tongue in shame for saying it, was the most beautiful sight I've ever seen. It was a night when London was ringed and stabbed with fire. So, London during the Blitz. Well, I came back and uh, spent another couple of years writing articles and uh, again it, it wasn't very satisfying and it, I certainly was aware that things were happening that I was missing and so eventually I got sent back to Europe and uh, uh, ended up uh, first in uh, North Africa and uh, from North Africa uh, I ended up in uh, Italy and after I was in Italy, I was in England. And uh, they tried to get me to wear a uniform. <laughs> I kind of made my own uniform. And, uh, and it had its advantages, uh, believe me. Uh, first of all, I, if, I, if I needed a better pair of pants, I could just scrounge them and it didn't matter what service they were. Uh, I could wear those. And uh, there's a funny difference between the brass and the GIs. Most of the correspondence that I knew over there hung out with the brass. And it's logical. Uh, that's where the decisions get made. It's where the plans are made. Uh, you got better accommodations. 
better places to stay. But I always figured that one of the problems with uh, a correspondent hanging out with the brass is they all outrank you. Uh, I hung out with GIs. Now, I was King Pup among the GIs. Uh, they called me Pops. <laughs> so I was quite a bit older than them, uh, but we got along. And I have to admit, I enjoyed their company far more than I ever enjoyed the company of the brass. Uh, but I also found that if I didn't wear an official uniform, and, and correspondents had their own uniform, uh, if I didn't wear uh, an official uniform, it was just a lot easier to talk to the, to the GIs. Uh, and, and, and I did. And uh, so that was my, that, that was my uniform. Uh, what's this? <laughs> yes, there are those GIs. Uh, I did enjoy their company, and they always took real good care of me. Um, they, they referred to themselves as the goddamned infantry. Uh, and <laughs> I wrote a couple of columns about them. Here's some little pieces. Uh, Dateline Bizerti, North Africa. Now to the infantry, the goddamned infantry, as they like to call themselves. I love the infantry because they're the underdogs. They are the mud, rain, frost, and wind boys. They have no comforts, and they even learn to live without the necessities. And in the end, they're the guys that wars can't be won without. And then later I said, uh, uh, still in North Africa, certainly there are great tragedies, unbelievable heroics, even a constant undertone of comedy. It's the job of us writers to transfer all that drama back to you folks at home. Most of the other correspondents have the ability to do it. But when I sit down to write, here's what I see instead. Men at the front suffering and wishing they were somewhere else. Men in routine jobs just behind the lines, belly aching because they can't get to the front. All of them desperately hungry for somebody to talk to besides themselves. No women to be heroes in front of. Damn little wine to drink. Precious little song. Cold and fairly dirty. Just toiling from day to day in a world full of insecurity, discomfort, homesickness, and a dulled sense of danger. What do we got here? Oh, well, this changed everything. This is uh, Anzio, and uh, I should have known better. One of the few times I actually stayed in a hotel room, wouldn't you know? I, I should have stayed out on the, on the open ground in a haystack, uh, just a poncho over me, but no, I'm going to get a hot bath, and I'm going to stay in a room, and that was the room that the Germans decided to send a shell through. And, uh, and boy, did it go through there. I wrote about it after I had composed myself. Uh, Anzio, Natuno, Italy. Suddenly, one whole wall of my room flew in, burying the bed where I'd been a few seconds before under hundreds of pounds of brick, stone, and mortar. Then the wooden doors were ripped off their hinges and crashed into the room. Another wall started to tumble but caught only part way down. The French doors leading to the balcony blew out. As I sat cowering in the corner, I remember fretting because my steel hat had blown off with the first blast and I couldn't find it. Later, I found it right beside me. My typewriter was full of mortar and broken glass, but it wasn't damaged. It continued to work. Um, you know, that's a, a funny little detail. <laughs> my helmet, when I got up that morning, I went over to brush my teeth, and I just had on my long johns, and I thought, well, I'll, I, I'm not sure why I decided I put on my steel helmet. And I didn't buckle my chin strap. Because if you knew anything about being over there in combat, you didn't buckle your chin strap. Because a blast like that one would grab your helmet and pull it off your head. And if your chin strap was fastened, it'd break your neck. 
So we all got in the habit of either buckling it up here or just letting it hang down. We didn't buckle our chin straps. And that, that probably saved me. Because that blast had enough power to blow that thing off my head. And if my chin strap had been fastened, it might have broken my neck. So that was, that was Italy. Well, from Anzio, I went back to England. And I was in the D-Day landing on Normandy. I went in D plus one. It was still plenty hot. And the experience is like in my room in Anzio. And with the D-Day landing, I was very aware that I'd been there too long. I'd stayed too long at the fair. And I had to get out of there. And I had to get back to the United States. And I did. Fortunately, I was able to get out of there and I, I got a, a, a steamer back and um, landed back in the United States. And by this time, unbeknownst to me, I'd become a kind of celebrity. And one of the first things that happened was that Life magazine sent a photographer around to, to, to take my picture and, and do a story. And, uh, and he took a portrait of me and he later he, he gave me a copy of it and I've kind of kept it. Uh, for some pretty personal reasons. I'd stayed way too long. And this was not the man that went over uh, to Europe a uh, bare two or, two, two or three years before. Uh, it had really taken its toll on me. And uh, the, the, one of the, the last articles that I wrote over there, it's kind of long, but I want to read it. I, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's not real fair for me to say, but I think it's the best thing I ever wrote. If you'll bear with me. It's called The Death of Captain Waskow. At the front lines in Italy, January 10th, 1944. In this war, I've known a lot of officers who were loved and respected by the soldiers under them. But never have I crossed the trail of any man as beloved as Captain Henry T. Waskow of Belton, Texas. Captain Waskow was a company commander in the 36th Division. He led his company since long before it left the States. He was very young, only in his middle 20s. But he carried in him a sincerity and gentleness that made people want to be guided by him. After my own father, he came next, the sergeant told me. He always looked after us, the soldier said. He'd go to bat for us every time. I've never known him to do anything unfair, another one said. I was at the foot of the mule trail the night they brought Captain Waskow's body down. The moon was nearly full at the time, and you could see far up the trail, and even partway across the valley below. Soldiers made shadows in the moonlight as they walked. Dead men had been coming down the mountain all evening, lashed onto the backs of mules. They came lying belly down across the wooden pack saddles, their heads hanging down on the left side of the mule, their stiffened legs sticking out awkwardly from the other side, bobbing up and down as the mule walked. The Italian mule skinners were afraid to walk beside dead men. So Americans had to lead the mules down that night. Even the Americans were reluctant to unlash and lift off the bodies at the bottom, so an officer had to do it himself and ask others to help. The first one came early in the morning. They slid him down from the mule and stood him on his feet for a moment while they got a new grip. In the half light, he might have been merely a sick man standing there, leaning on the others. Then they laid him on the ground in the shadow of the low stone wall alongside the road. I don't know who that first one was. You feel small in the presence of dead men and ashamed at being alive and you don't ask silly questions. We left him there beside the road, that first one, and we all went back into the cow shed and sat on water cans or lay on the straw waiting for the next batch of mules. Somebody said the dead soldier had been dead for four days and then nobody said anything more about it. We talked soldier talk for an hour or more. The dead men lay all alone outside in the shadow of the low stone wall. Then a soldier came into the cow shed and said there were some more bodies outside. We went out into the road, 
Four mules stood there in the moonlight in the road where the trail came down off the mountain. The soldiers who led them stood there waiting. This one is Captain Waskow, one of them said quietly. Two men unlashed his body from the mule and lifted it off and laid it on the shadow beside the low stone wall. Other men took other bodies off. Finally, there were five lying end to end in a long row alongside the road. You don't cover up dead men in the combat zone. They just lie there in the shadows until somebody else comes after them. The unburdened mules moved off to their olive orchard. The men in the road seemed reluctant to leave. They stood around and gradually, one by one, I could sense them moving closer to Captain Waskow's body. Not so much to look, I think, as to say something in finality to him and to themselves. I stood close by and I could hear. One soldier came and looked down and he said out loud, God damn it. That's all he said and he walked away. Another one came. He said, God damn it to hell anyway. He looked down for a few last moments and then he turned and left. Another man came. I think he was an officer. It was hard to tell officers from men in the half light for all were bearded and grimy dirty. The man looked down into the dead captain's face and then he spoke directly to him as though he were alive. He said, I'm sorry old man. Then a soldier came and stood beside the officer and bent over and he too spoke to his dead captain, not in a whisper but awfully tenderly. He said, I sure am sorry sir. Then the first man squatted down and he reached down and he took the dead hand. And he sat there for a full five minutes holding the dead hand in his own and looking intently into the dead face. And he never uttered a sound all the time he sat there. And finally he put the hand down and then reached up and gently straightened the points of the captain's shirt collar. And then he sort of rearranged the tattered edges of his uniform around the wound. And then he got up and walked away down the road in the moonlight, all alone. After the rest of us went back into the cowshed, leaving the five dead men lying in a line end to end in the shadow of the low stone wall, we lay down on the straw in the cowshed, and pretty soon we were all asleep. <laughs> the stuff I keep. <laughs> I made the cover of Time. <laughs> Time Magazine. I was not thrilled with this article. Um, they made up stuff. And, and I still get at uh, Some story about me diving into a foxhole in North Africa in a, in a bombing run and looking over at the guy next to me and saying, are you okay? And he was dead. It never happened. I don't, where do they get that stuff? I have no idea. Uh, he said that the GIs used to play, uh, didn't like me at first, and they played practical jokes on me, and, and they called me old man and, and, and made fun. Never happened. I, the worst part, when that fellow from Time came by, he asked me about Jerry. He asked me about my wife. And I didn't share a lot of details, but I just said she's had a rough time and I would appreciate it if you'd just kind of take it easy on her in your article. Well, his response to that was to leave her out altogether, as if she'd never existed. That, that girl who rides with me, who spent all that time and, and never mentioned in that article. And I was really, I was really unhappy about that. Another uh, aspect of celebrity, uh, <laughs> you get, get to do magazine, magazine ads. Uh, this one was for um, Chesterfields. But you know, the funny thing about this picture uh, you can't really see it, but I'm holding a Zippo lighter. And I wrote a column about Zippo lighters. And, and that they were probably the most prized possession of any GI in the European theater 
was a genuine Zippo lighter because they'd lighten the wind, they'd lighten the rain, the altitude didn't bother them, they were just great. And so I wrote this article about Zippo lighters, and the next thing I know, I get this package in the mail from the Zippo company, and it's 50 Zippo lighters. <laughs> and I got one of those every month. And I pass them out, and I hear that that's a pretty good thing is to have a Zippo lighter that you got from Ernie Pyle. And so, uh, I, I'm not sure why Chesterfield didn't show the Zippo lighter, because I'm sure that's what I've got there, but, uh, but they didn't. So anyway, uh, what's this? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, it's our dog, Cheetah. And we're uh, up on the Mesa uh, in Albuquerque. And, uh, you know, I got, I got Cheetah for the same reason we built the house. It was, it was, it was for Jerry. And uh, I, 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 I hope that if she had something to love and take care of and that loved her and, and undivided attention, uh, it would help her. And damned if that dog didn't like me more than her. So I got her a Great Dane. And that dog died in three months. So I wasn't doing real good in the, in the dog department. Uh, but uh, uh, Cheetah's doing fine and, uh, and living there in Albuquerque with Jerry and, uh, and a great dog. I've always, always liked dogs. Uh, had a dog when I was a boy named Shep. And it was kind of a, of a, of a, a, a collie shepherd mix, just like uh, Cheetah. We, we called the dog Cheetah because Jerry always wanted a real Cheetah. And I figured that's not going to work. Um, and so uh, I got her the dog, and we just named the dog, the dog Cheetah. Uh, while I was uh, back in the States uh, the last time, uh, after I came back from Europe, um, my friend Paige Cavanaugh, who I had met at Indiana University. Uh, by this time, he had ended up out in California. And he knew some movie people. One of the movie people he knew was a producer named Lester Cowan. And somehow, Paige convinced Lester uh, that they ought to make a movie about me. And uh, they didn't ask me. Because uh, if they had asked me, I'd have said, nothing doing. But uh, by the time Paige contacted me, this was already a done deal. I'm convinced to this day that Paige Cavanaugh put this deal together so he'd have a job. Uh, but uh, he signed on as a, as a technical advisor uh, for this movie. But one of the benefits of the movie, uh, I've got, got here, uh, they did send me, now the movie's not out yet. The movie's not, at, not due to be out until July uh, of this year, uh, July 1945. But, you know, they do this stuff ahead of time, and they'd already printed up the lobby card uh, for, for, for my movie. Um, they called it the, the uh, Ernie Pyle's Story of G.I. Joe. And uh, the guy that they got to play me uh, was Burgess Meredith. And uh, the, they didn't do a bad job with this movie. I have to say, from what I've seen of it. I was on set for a few days, uh, got to see him do that. They would send rushes to me in Albuquerque. And one of the local theater operators in Albuquerque would let me screen these, these rushes. And it looked pretty good, it looked pretty authentic. One of the reasons it was authentic was because they had over 100 real GIs. Guys who had just recently come back from Europe uh, and were training to go to the Pacific and while they were here, they had them act in this movie. Uh, there's one rush they sent me, it's this artillery crew. They managed to fire 10 artillery rounds in about 30 seconds. And it, it's like watching a ballet. And the reason they're so good at it is because it's the actual artillery team uh, that they got to shoot off these artillery rounds in the movie. Um, they they uh, uh, asked a lot of GIs what they thought ought to be in the movie. And so their, their content was, uh, was dead on. Didn't hurt, too, that they had this fellow working on a screenplay, uh, a guy named Arthur Miller, uh, who came to Albuquerque, 
uh, and he and I did a fair amount of drinking uh, in Albuquerque. Um, and the, the fellow that they got to play the lead role in the movie uh, was Robert Mitchum. And he'd had a few parts uh, in, in the movies, uh, but this was the first really big part for, for Robert Mitchum. Uh, and from what I saw in the rushes, uh, he did a good job. Uh, one thing I was kind of worried about, the guy they got to play me uh, was, uh, was Burgess Meredith. From what I can tell, he was about 26 years old when they, when they got him to, uh, uh, to play this role. And um, I was 45. <laughs> but they, you know, magic of Hollywood, uh, they made him up. And, uh, and, and again, from what I saw in the rushes, he was not a bad Ernie, Ernie Pyle. Uh, uh, ain't a great thing to be in the first place, but uh, if you're going to be Ernie Pyle, he was, he was a pretty good one. So um, the other nice thing about working on this movie, even though it was limited, uh, I got to see my friend Paige Cavanaugh. And uh, while we were out there in Hollywood, uh, my friend Lee Miller came out. And so it was me and Paige Cavanaugh and Lee Miller, and we got to hang out in Hollywood uh, and, and we had a really, really good time, uh, no, no doubt about that. Paige Cavanaugh, Lee Miller, and in Albuquerque, Ed, Ed Schaefer. I never thought about that till just now. All the people I've known, all the people I've met, thousands, tens of thousands of people, those three men are probably the only real good friends I have. Because like I said before, uh, we'd go someplace and we'd meet people and, and, and they're acquaintances, but they're not friends. And then we'd move on and maybe never see them again. And you don't make real close friends when you're living like that. But Kavanaugh and Miller and, and Ed Schaefer in Albuquerque uh, were true friends and may have been the only three true friends uh, that I ever had. Which is kind of funny when you think about all the people that I know. Well, uh, I decided to go back. Go back to war. I'd been to Europe. I'd been there too long. I knew that. And yet I felt compelled to go back. And uh, one of the reasons was because when I was in Europe, I wrote about the Army. To some extent, I wrote about the Air Corps, but that's the Army Air Corps. That's, that's the Army. I'd never written anything about the Navy. And after I got back to the States, I realized that uh, uh, the, the, the Navy made it pretty clear to me uh, that they weren't happy about that. And so why don't you write about the Navy? And what about the Marines? Uh, and, and so I, I, I made the decision uh, to go back. And I have to say, the, the Navy takes a great portrait. And they actually got me to wear a uniform, which I thought was, was pretty unusual. Um, but I wrote this column just before I went back. This would, this would be this last January. I said, anybody who's been to war and wants to go back is a plain damn fool in my book. I'm going simply because there's a war on and I'm part of it and I've known all the time I was going back. I'm going simply because I've got to and I hate it. One man said to me one day in complete good faith, tell me now just exactly what is it you don't like about war? I think I must have turned a little white. And all I could do was look at him in shock and say, good God, if you don't know, then I could never tell you. It's little things like that that make returning soldiers feel like their misery has been all in vain. But I did go back. And, uh, <laughs> you know, one nice thing about being Ernie Pyle, every place I go, there's, there's reporters and, and there's photographers. And I probably had my picture taken more than anybody but Eisenhower and Bradley in World War II. 
uh, and and uh, they give me prints and 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 I, I keep them because they remind me of the great folks, the great the great fellows that I've met uh, and talked to and, and heard their stories and and uh, this is this is on the ship. Uh, this is this is probably uh, somewhere between Hawaii and Guam. And, uh, and, and look at those fellas. <laughs> they look pretty healthy, don't they? <laughs> uh, well, that's what I thought. You know, I'm on a ship with these guys, these, these sailors and Marines, and compared to what I've been through in Europe, <laughs> they, they got it easy. You got hot chow, you got bunks, you got showers, you got movies. That's what I thought. I even wrote a column about that, about how the Navy and the Marines had it soft. Not a good idea. <laughs> Especially when you're on a ship with these guys. <laughs> and somebody sends them a, a clipping from the Indianapolis Daily News that, uh, <laughs> that you wrote about them. And they, they weren't happy at all. And, uh, and I was wrong. I was probably as wrong as I've ever been in my life. And I learned that the first invasion I went on in the Pacific. And I learned that if anything, they had it worse. And more of them died. And it was a more miserable place to be than, than Europe could ever, ever dream of being. And uh, one of the fellows I met in the European theater, actually another, another fellow from New Mexico, a young guy, he couldn't have been more than 24 years old, uh, a guy named Bill Malden. And uh, uh, he, he, when I first met him, he, he was doing cartoons for the 45th Infantry Division newsletter and, uh, and drawing his characters, Willie and, and Joe, uh, to kind of a limited audience. And I took one look at these guys, and I, I, and I know these guys. I've been hanging out with these guys for the last three years. Uh, and, and that Malden was, was something pretty special. The reason I got to know him in the first place is because he was born in New Mexico. Born down in uh, a Mountain Park, down in the southern part of the state. And I always tried to look up New Mexicans, uh, every place I went. And, and we always had a kind of special affinity. And I was like that with, uh, with Malden. And one of the things that I was able to do that I'm really proud of, uh, I brought Malden to the attention of Stars and Stripes. And so he, they, they hired him immediately after they saw Willie and Joe. And, and uh, uh, as a result of that, he got syndicated in newspapers in the United States. Now, I knew about syndication because when I started my aviation column, uh, I was probably syndicated in 25 or, or 30 newspapers. Uh, uh, by the time I got here uh, in the Pacific, I'm, I'm syndicated in 250 columns. And so I, I knew about syndication and I knew how it worked and I knew what a value it was. And so I urged uh, Malden and, and uh, uh, the, the uh, newspaper syndicators that uh, you, know, you ought to pay attention to this guy and, and get him syndicated, and they did. And uh, uh, as far as I know, last, last I heard from him, he was doing pretty good um, writing these, um, writing these uh, uh, drawing these cartoons. And the thing that I realized after going on a couple of invasions with the, with the Marines was uh, the Marines are no different uh, than those uh, GIs in Europe. And um, uh, they, they were just as brave and they dealt with the same hardships. And, uh, you know, uh, Malden drew Willie and Joe in, uh, in Europe. Uh, but I'm, I'm, uh, somebody just took my picture with this fella. Uh, I've got his name written down somewhere. I, I was always real careful to do, to do two things. To get the names of the people I talked to and to find out what their hometown was. And the reason I did that was because I didn't want to be in a situation where I had mentioned a name of someone who either was going to die or had died. And there'd be confusion. Because a lot of GIs have the same names. 
and I wanted to be absolutely sure that when somebody read one of my columns and I mentioned someone's name, that I also mentioned their hometown so they'd know which uh, uh, Seymour Smith I was talking about. And I was always, I was always real, real careful about that. Um, so, you know, if that isn't Willie or Joe, uh, <laughs> I don't know who is. Um, so, <laughs> well, I'm waiting here for a Jeep. Uh, supposed to go with the commanding officer, and uh, he said that I could uh, uh, go with them and, and uh, uh, watch some troop movements. And uh, I'm just, I, I'm not sure when. Uh, Oh, there's, there's, there's my Jeep. So, um, I guess I better go. They never tried to keep him on the farm. 
and they, they made it possible for him to go to the University of Indiana. They made it possible for him to have that car. They took him on trips. Uh, they allowed him to go to the Indianapolis 500. And so they always supported that wanderlust uh, that Ernie had. And it must have uh, been very hard for them to do that. Yes. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. It's very perceptive. Yeah, he was an only child. Uh, there was another one. Yes. Do you know that I'm trying to climb some movies last night? They <laughs> ran the story of G.I. Joe. Yes. And I just watched it about two hours ago. What did, what? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I watched it myself last night. I've seen it several times. Uh, it's not easy to find, but it is remarkable how good it is uh, and how good Robert Mitchum is. Uh, that motion picture was nominated for four Academy Awards. Of course, Ernie didn't know that uh, because it hadn't been released when he was killed. Uh, it was nominated for four Academy Awards, and one of the awards was for supporting actor for Robert Mitchum. And so, and uh, 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 I'm not sure if he won the award or not, but he was certainly nominated. Yes? May I just say that you did such a good job that I found myself thinking of you as Ernie Pyle. <laughs> Be still my heart. Uh, then you've now made it possible for me to share even a portion of the trepidation uh, with which I came up to this group uh, to present Ernie Pyle, and especially because of, of who Ernie was. Uh, Ernie says you don't ask silly questions around dead people, uh, and you also don't trivialize their lives. And uh, I, I've been very aware through this whole process of, uh, of wanting to do honor to Ernie. And I, I thank you so much for your comments. That, that means a lot. Thank you. Have you done this presentation before? This is the second time. Uh, I opened in Philadelphia <laughs> <laughs> last Thursday for a group in Albuquerque called Las Amapolas. Uh, and, uh, and, and we had um, uh, several folks. I have to say, your singing is, is the best. Uh, and and let, let's hear it for, for Dame uh, 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 Vera Lynn. Uh, I think that's one of the great songs to come out of World War II. I really do. And uh, unfortunately, Stanley Kubrick used it as the, the, the closing scenes in uh, how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. Uh, with a multitude of atomic explosions uh, over Berlin instead of pictures of Ernie. So I kind of toned it down a little bit for, uh, for this presentation. The house uh, in Albuquerque where they lived, mm -hmm. uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that and what it's used for today? Uh, it's, it, the, the house was built in 1940 uh, by um, uh, Earl Mount and Arthur McCollum, uh, who also became friends of the Piles, more their children than anything else. Uh, some of the most moving descriptions of, of what Ernie was like uh, come from Ed Schaefer's kids and, and Earl Mount and, and Arthur McCollum's kids. <clears throat> they built the house uh, uh, for Ernie and, and Jerry. Uh, they only lived in it for, for five years, and Ernie probably no more than six months that he actually got to live in that house. Uh, he loved the time he was there, um, but it, uh, uh, in 1948, uh, uh, there was some questions about Ernie's estate and so on and so forth. But in 1948, the city of Albuquerque acquired the house. And it became the first branch of the Albuquerque Public Library. Uh, and in the uh, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up category, uh, the uh, uh, magazine reading room in the Ernie Pyle Branch Library at 900 Girard uh, Avenue in Albuquerque uh, the magazine reading room is the bathroom. <laughs> that's the funny part. The sad part is that's the bathroom that Jerry tried to kill herself in by stabbing herself in the neck with scissors. Uh, she was not successful. And it was Cheetah that saved her life. Uh, because Cheetah alerted the uh, caretaker who was at the house taking care of Jerry. Jerry couldn't be left alone by this time. Uh, and Cheetah, uh, sensing the problem, alerted the caretaker. The caretaker uh, uh, ran and got Ernie. 
and Ernie kicked the door in and, uh, and saved her life. So, uh, but that's the branch library. And a, a kind of a personal note, I really couldn't decide whether to do this as a presentation or as a performance. And one of the reasons that I had decided to do it as a presentation was because I couldn't come up with a scenario. I couldn't come up with the business uh, to make it worth acting. And, uh, and I ended up at the Ernie Pyle Branch Library at 900 Girard in Albuquerque. And there's, a, there's one room in the library that's almost a shrine to Ernie. And there are some of his, his actual typescript uh, uh, columns. Uh, the death of Captain Waskow is there in, in Ernie's original typescript. And, uh, and so I'm sitting in the library and there are also a lot of snapshots around. Uh, Ernie had a lot of photographs taken of him. And so I'm looking at these snapshots and that's when the idea of the pictures and then being able to, because you can't see the pictures that I'm holding here, and so then the idea to project them behind me. Uh, and so this kind of unseen audience can see the photographs that I'm looking at, and I'm probably just talking to a couple of other GIs there in the tent, and, and we always share stories like that. They've all got their pictures, and they bring out their pictures, and I bring out mine. But I got that idea, I don't want to say it was a flash of insight, but, uh, it was pretty dramatic uh, that I could use photographs as the scenario. Um, and then it was a matter of placing it in time. Uh, this, this in real time is, is actually the last 45 minutes of Ernie's life. Because literally after that Jeep arrived, he gets in that Jeep and no more than 15 minutes later he's dead. A uh, Japanese machine gun sniper uh, took him down. Uh, April 18th. 1945. Yeah. No, no children. Uh, in fact, at one point in her delusion, uh, Jerry felt that having kids, and they're both in their, their early 40s by this time, uh, Jerry thought that having kids would make things better. And uh, Ernie didn't have much more sense than, than Jerry did. They were both alcoholics. Uh, Jerry had the additional problem of drugs, uh, which compounded things. Um, but Ernie, uh, a, a, as much as he himself was conflicted, uh, knew uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that that would be the absolute worst thing uh, that could happen to either one of them. And so they never did have children. They had cheetah, but no children. I want to commend you for your presentation. I think it's extremely special. Uh, I'm a World War II historian, and uh, my mother always spoke about Ernie Pyle. So when I was in Okinawa doing research, we took a, um, a car and drove all the way up the island and took a ferry over to see where Ernie Pyle was shot. And uh, there is a memorial there. Have you been there? No, I haven't. Uh, he was buried originally on Iashima Island, then they moved him to the Punch Bowl in Hawaii. Yes. Uh, that and was his it, second. They, they have an area with just green grass that's kept by the military. There was a station there. And um, an obelisk um, saying this is the spot where he was shot. So then I went to the punch bowl and he, uh, he's buried in a plot uh, that's very small and tiny. And the plaque uh, that has his name on it is very, um, it's like all the others. Yeah. And, um, but it was, it was a great thrill for me to visit both places. Yeah, must have been. Uh, you could see from that last photograph of Jerry receiving the posthumous award in Washington, D.C., uh, she did not look good. She had maybe another three months to live. Uh, she didn't last uh, five or six months after, after uh, Ernie was killed. And, uh, Ernie, I would like to ask you, you mentioned that he was moved over to the punch bowl. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that is? Uh, it's a, it's a, a cemetery in, Hawa in Hawaii. Uh, crater. Yeah, yeah, right. It's a beautiful site. You've been there. Yes. Uh, Jerry, as I said, uh, didn't last more than a few months after Ernie died. Uh, she had an ulcer uh, that ate through an artery and she hemorrhaged. Uh, but Jerry, is buried 
in Arlington National Cemetery. And she is either one of the very few or the only non-military person buried at Arlington National Cemetery. And so that's, that's quite an honor for her. But you could see from that, that last photograph, she deteriorated uh, dramatically at the end. So. Uh, one uh, uh, last personal note, if you'll indulge me for just a moment. Um, and I've been asked a few times, uh, why was I interested in Ernie Pyle in the first place? I'm, I'm, uh, I was born, uh, Ernie was dead by the time I was born. But my father followed Ernie. Uh, my father was in North Africa. He was in Sicily. And then later he was in London. And uh, I, I, you folks who had dinner with us tonight, please excuse me because you've heard this story. But um, when my father was on the farm in central Ohio, about 12 counties away from where Ernie grew up, uh, in, the, in the early 30s, 1932, 1933, there was a commercial airline flight that went from Buffalo, New York to Indianapolis, Indiana. And it flew at night. And of course, no uh, 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 pressurized cabins. They flew low, at about 10,000 feet. And so this airplane would fly over my family farm uh, in the early evening. And if my father happened to be out on the porch or in the yard when this plane came over, he would flash the porch lights. And the pilot would flash the wing lights. <laughs> And, and, you know, it, it wasn't an, an everyday thing. If my dad happened to be out there, he'd flash the light. I'm sure if he didn't get the light flashed, the pilot would flash his wing lights anyway. Uh, no big deal. So a few years later, my father is in London, England. And he's working for Eisenhower. And Eisenhower had a particular problem with D-Day uh, because the Americans and the British had to cooperate to invade Normandy. And they weren't doing well. Uh, the uh, Americans, uh, the British thought the Americans were barbarians because they ate with their enlisted men. <laughs> and the Americans thought the British were snobs because they wouldn't. And they would be in these camps and, and they'd start bug tussling with each other. And so Eisenhower recruited American officers who had gone to school in England. And my father had. Oxford University, 1926 to 1929. And so there'd be one of these flare-ups at a, at a base, and my dad would be sent out, and he would try to find a British officer that he had either gone to school with or knew someone that he had gone to school with. And the two of them would then get together, and they'd iron out these problems, and training could go on. So that's what my father is doing in, in uh, uh, 1944 in London. And one night, you can't make this stuff up, one night he's having dinner at the Dorchester Hotel in London and behind him is a table of B-17 pilots. And one of the B-17 pilots is telling his buddies about this crazy ass farmer in Ohio <laughs> when he was working for TWA that used to flash his porch light. <laughs> and my dad reached behind him and tapped him on the shoulder and said, meet the crazy ass farmer. <laughs> and there is no question that he was the pilot, my father was the farmer, and I know that story because the pilot, a man named Hetzel, uh, went career Air Force after the war. And every time he had Air Force business at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, about 30 miles from my hometown, Colonel Hetzel would stay at our house and I thought he was a god. <laughs> I thought he was a god. And he and my dad would just share stories, and, and so that's, uh, that, that has a lot to do with my interest in Ernie Pyle, uh, because the two of them paralleled. And, and of course, my dad told me about Ernie. And, 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 and growing up on a farm in a small town in, o in central Ohio, uh, and Ernie growing up on a, small uh, on a farm in a small town in o Indiana, uh, I understand a lot of what motivated Ernie. So thank you so much for indulging me. Thank you. Thank you.